Welcome to Psychology Concepts Explained, and this is your host, Dr. C, professor of psychology for over 20 years and teaching only online classes for over 10 years. I hope you enjoy this podcast. When you take an introductory to psychology course or a lifespan class at the undergraduate level or many other undergraduate psychology classes, you're bound to have an early chapter that focuses on research in psychology. And it doesn't seem like the most exciting way to start off a psychology course because, for example, an introductory to psychology, at the end of the book you'll see a discussion about mental disorders. Along the way you'll see uh, chapters about personality, stress, and memory, all very interesting subjects. But we don't start off in a very exciting way. We start off with research. Boy, sounds pretty boring, right? But think of it as a foundation to a home. Uh, you can't really build the rest of the home without a strong foundation. And a strong foundation in understanding psychology and all the different theories that go along with it is understanding how research actually works. Now, to give you a big picture of what to expect, and I'll explain some more details in a uh, future podcast. But the reason you want to understand how psychology research works is to understand specifically the research methods. So a method is basically a technique, an approach to try to study human behavior or what's going on in the mind. So uh, psychologists, when they do research, they know ahead of time when they're planning their study whether or not this research method is... Uh, a strong method, a relatively weak method, or uh, the best method given the circumstances of what you want to study. So for example, a psychologist may want to look at historical records to see if there's a relationship between, let's say, household income and graduation rates in the home, right? Now there are many ways to go about studying that. Uh, you can give out lots of surveys to people now to find out their income and how many people in the family have graduated high school, for example. Or you can look at old data, what's called archival data, that might be publicly available uh, that you can get maybe from 50 years ago and still do the same kind of research. So depending on how the data is collected will depend on uh, what the quality of the method is going to be used. So one thing you will get out of this kind of chapter is to know in your mind when you're done is which method is the ideal method that gives you the best conclusions, the strongest evidence to explain a behavior. And then the next level down, whether or not that method was chosen out of circumstances that there's no other choice, that human subjects might be harmed unless we use method B. And then you need to know what are the strengths and weaknesses of method B? What kind of information does that give you? So there's a little bit of statistics involved, but very light, usually in a first-year psychology course when it comes to understanding research methods. But the main comparison between two major methods usually come between the correlational method and the experimental method. So those will be explained later. But uh, as an average person absorbing news stories out online, you need to know. You need to be able to figure out from the details of a story, an article, what kind of method was used because then that will tell you, well, oh, okay, that is either very strong evidence that maybe I should take this guidance for myself in terms of whether or not to take a supplement or a medication that affects my health or whether or not you can take that result with a grain of salt and say, well, there seems to be some evidence there but it's relatively weak or maybe it doesn't apply to me in this case. So just knowing where the source of the information comes from is not really enough. You really need to get to the next level to think like a psychologist, to think scientifically how a particular study was conducted, right? Uh, even just one example of a survey study. Well, every, every survey has a strength and a weakness. The strength is you can interview lots of people really quickly with a robocall machine, for example. You can call people's households, people's cell phones, text people to find out, you know, which political candidate is in the lead and which ones people tend to prefer. But then you have to think about, well, what's the weakness of that kind of research, right? Maybe it doesn't reach everyone. 
Maybe it only reaches a particular demographic, a group of people, a particular age group, those who have that technology, right? So maybe we're missing out on something by using that technique. So before someone, like a psychologist, conducts research, when they choose a method, like a telephone survey, they already know ahead of time what the strengths and weaknesses of that format, of that method will be, so that when they write their conclusions, they're very cautious. Another thing to point out is that when you listen to health, medical, psychological experts, the actual researchers, when they try to explain their research, it always sounds like they're not really sure. Well, did it happen? Did it work? Just give me a conclusion. And they use a lot of words like could, might, it's associated with this, there are some trends, and that's because they want to be careful in describing exactly what the data is showing. Because when we're studying human behavior, nothing really works at a 100% level, even if it's a medication. As you know, taking an antibiotic can affect one person and it may not work for another person. So we have to look at the, the numbers and the trends and the probabilities of something happening or something explaining a particular kind of behavior. Uh, and that's why you hear a lot of this tentative language, because scientists are very careful about how they want to express the data, not to give the wrong impression that if you do A, B, and C in that sequence, then 100% of the time, C, D, and F will happen, okay? And that's how science works. So by the conclusion of reading this particular chapter in a psychology textbook, that's what you want to get out of it. Understanding the different methods, understand that even though these methods have strengths and weaknesses, they're all considered scientific methods. Sometimes students falsely believe that only the experiment is scientific. In other words, they attach that word scientific or empirical to just one method. Whereas even an observation or an interview or a case study, those are still considered empirical research or scientific research. They all are. They're just different kinds of ways to approach a problem to understand a behavior, okay? So that's one of the main things I want you to get out of understanding a research and psychology chapter from any course that you're taking is understanding how each one works, what the kind of information it tells you, but also that it's all considered scientific research. There's just that some are stronger than others or more powerful than others. Okay, that's it. Thanks for listening. This is Dr. C, and I'll talk to you soon. If you enjoyed this podcast, please follow me on anchor.fm slash jackbteaching. That's Jack, the letter B, and the word teaching. And you can reach me on Twitter. My handle is also at Jack B. Teaching. Thank you.